All right, as I told you before, uh, when we had various quotes and things that Mr. Ball will be here, and simply what we'll do is have a, a straight question and answer period, Q&A, uh, and I'll try to repeat the question as much as possible so that in case any people can't hear it, and we'll just, just, just get to it. So uh, I'll just try to moderate and point out and get some people, whoever wants to ask questions. Okay, let's get to it. Do you want to say? Okay. All right, somebody down front here. Let's hear what you have to say. Let's get another mic. Hold on. I already gave them a lot about your background and all this stuff, so we can cut all the window dressing out. <laughs> all right, question. Go ahead. First question. So the question comes is, uh, how, how is it to be American in a foreign country? That's essentially what it is. Well, um, you're, I think you're referring to uh, something I said a long time ago when I said that I became an American for the first time when I stepped off the boat in France when I was 24, yeah. <laughs> well, when I got to France, I discovered that I wasn't anything else. I wasn't uh, French. I wasn't African. I've been born, in fact, in Harlem, and whether I liked it or not, I was an American. And being an American abroad, being a black American abroad in those years, because it's um, not quite the same now, was um, very bewildering. Very bewildering because the, uh, European, the Europeans assumed a relationship to my country, which in fact I didn't have. You know, they, Europe knows very little about America until today. And, and people know almost nothing at all about the black American, which is simply um, a source of confusion in the European mind. <laughs> you know, Americans are by definition white. A black American is a contradiction in terms, you know. And to make them understand this, and to make yourself understand it, is part of what I was talking about. Well, we'll just take one follow-up, sure. Okay, we'll take another question. Next question. Okay, right back here. Okay, uh, okay, the question is, is he familiar with the rising su suicide rate among the youngsters here in this country? the blacks in particular, and what, you, what, what are his views on that? I'm repeating the questions for the benefit of our tape here. I'm aware of, I'm aware of that, of the rising suicide rate. What my views are on it, um, well, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't um, I'm not sure my views are very relevant, but it isn't very hard to see why there would be a rising suicide rate among, black pe among young black people. The question is how to arrest it. And, and how to arrest it is by creating some kind of, um, creating, a, creating a situation in which, there, in which there is some hope. What, what, you're, what you're asking me is in effect, you know, you're asking me what are my views on, on, uh, on our situation and the latest manifestation of our trouble. We've always, we've always had to deal with this trouble, you know. I can't answer, you know, at this moment how, how to do this but since we see it happening around us, we know something has to be done. The trouble is we cannot expect any help from um, most of our co-citizens or any help from the government unless we can blackmail the government. You see what I mean? Um, it's a matter of jobs, you know, it's a matter, which is a matter of, of whether or not you have a future. And if a person thinks he has no future, he very often cuts his throat. The same, the same thing, it's the same thing behind the phenomenon of drugs. People become junkies because they're, because they're hopeless. 
And it is not, you know, this afternoon that we can, that we can, uh, we can arrive at a solution to that. But I think it's something that everyone has to work with. You know, because I got younger brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews too. And I'm scared to death about it. And I don't quite know what to do. That's the only honest, only honest answer I can give you. Okay, there's a hand over here. Would you know why this forum was so poorly publicized? Well, <laughs> <laughs> take it. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Baldwin will yield that to me. Uh, <laughs> frankly, I, I, I did not have the responsibility for publicizing, but I don't think it was so very public, uh, uh, so poorly publicized. At least there was a very big uh, poster on my window in the uh, office down there on San Pablo Avenue, at least. <laughs> and there were a few other things. A lot of people, I think, I don't think it was supportive. Uh, to answer your question, I don't think it was supportive publicized. Next question, over here. How can we get there from here? How can we get to... Okay, how can we build a non-racist society in this country? This is going to be a rough afternoon. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Don't pull up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make an attempt. A racist, the racist society we're speaking of, you know, um, is tied to the economic system. There's simply no way around that, you know. And racism is a product, a direct product, a willed product, and a desired product of that economic system. Now, we obviously are not going to be able to dismantle the economic system this afternoon, <laughs> but um, I think it's just as well to look at it as clearly as possible. Because racism, racism in this society has its own rewards. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a white person in this society who really tries to, um, really tries to visit those in prison, who really, who really does not believe in all, uh, in all the bullshit we've been taught all these years, is at once, in fact, treated just like a nigger. You know, he, he has become declassé. He is. Um, He's worse than a nigger in a way because he should know better. <laughs> now, the only thing we can do about that right now is to live the lives we think we should and try and aim it and work toward the world we think we want to have. And, and take whatever, you know, and pay whatever you have to pay behind it. There's nothing else to, there's no formula, and we won't get there, we won't, we won't get there from here tomorrow. Okay, let's take a question from this side of the room. Is there anyone? Okay, fine, right here. Okay, let me repeat the question. What do you, he said that, uh, how do you feel about Pan-Africanism for blacks instead of trying to look at the society as becoming a non-racist society? Well, frankly, no. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that. Um, that I don't think there's a contradiction in that. No, at all. I think that what you have to do, or, or what we have to do, and what she and what she's talking about, come out finally to be the same thing. At some level, we, at some point, we, at some point, we are, we, are, we are fated to meet. You know, because the pan the pan African society you're talking about, I agree with. You know, I agree with that. With this reservation, that we can go to Africa. You know, and we can do anything we want to do, really. But we cannot go back to Africa, and I point that point, I point that out because if you think you're going back to Africa, then you then you um, are likely to be disappointed. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Okay. Well, be, well, because because um, you in fact were not born in Africa, you know, you in fact are not, you know you in fact are not a part of that society. This is just this is only a matter. Of, I'm only pointing this out as a matter of fact. It's not an objection. But so that if you know you come to Africa from Detroit, let us say, you <laughs> <laughs> Well, very good, right on. <laughs> but if you know that, then you, then you are equipped to deal with what you'll find. That's what I'm saying. No. 
If I may interject something, I should say that when I was in Africa, when uh, I was very surprised to find out that I was referred to as white man. <laughs> yes, you, it's said, full of surprises. Damn, I better get a paint job. But it's very exciting too. I mean, it, I'm with you. Okay, let's see another question way in back. Yes. Question is what young Americans uh, write, what young American writers are helping to carry on uh, uh, your own point of view, and how are, how are you trying to shape them now? Well, um, how's trying to shape something? Is it, is it, that's it. Yes. Oh. Yeah. How are your own ideas changing, uh, young Americans? Let's um, let's uh, let's. Just it's a slightly difficult question. First of all, it's hard for me to name younger writers, even a little bit dangerous, because then <laughs> you, you obviously you leave somebody out. So, so I'll only say there about half a dozen, you know, um, younger people, very young people, who mean a great deal to me, and I think who mean who will mean in the future a great deal, to, a great deal to this country and to the world. And as it's very difficult for me to tell you precisely how they affect me, except that I depend on them. And I learn a great deal from them. I learn something about the world in which they live, which is also the world in which I live, but I'm much older. So the, so the, the world of a man of 25 is, um, is not exactly close to me, but it's not the world in which I operate. It's not, it's not, I'm not 25. But I, can learn, but I know a great many people who are 25, and I've got an enormous family who, you know, of all ages, which um, prevents me from being, they don't allow me to become stagnant. So all I can tell you is, is I'm trying to keep abreast, and I'm very grateful to mm -hmm. the people who are my comrades, who are younger than I. Okay, Brian, right here. So your question is, is black dyed the shield? Okay, the, the question is, is black dyed the shield or is it not a shield? And how does uh, Mr. Bowen view it with respect to reading uh, sort of thing? Well, you, you know, the word, it's the word dialect threw me a little bit because it, I didn't quite know what you meant. Um, you're talking about Negro, you're talking about black speech, Negro speech. Good. Oh yes, I know, I, I, uh, I understand what you mean now. No, I know what you mean now, and it's uh... <laughs> It's a technique. Um, it's a technique of, of survival, and it comes out of the fact that it comes out of the truth, which is that at one point in our history, I had to warn him about something while um, while you were listening, and he had to understand it, and you not understand it. You know that. You no, know, that's. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. You'll receive. No, but that's true. That's 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 exactly the root of black language. Well, you see, what you see. I know, I know. Then, you know, then you got a collision. But I tell you what, I think, in my view, what I've seen, and I've worked in, I worked a little bit in the public schools, and I, I got family in the public schools. It's more subtle than that. It is indeed a collision, but, but um, beneath 
the, the, the apparent problem, which is real, there is also almost always, on the part of the teacher, um, a contempt for the child's experience. Um, and the child reacts to that, you know, more than to the technical question of reading you know, or learning you know, standard English. I might add, by the way, that this is the most illiterate country in the world, and very few people are equipped to teach anybody anything. But <laughs> but if, if you see, in my experience, if, if the teacher can, oper can get through to the child, he or she can teach that child without menacing that child's way of life, without menacing that child's way of speaking. Because yeah, every black man in this country speaks to these speaks, speaks two languages, do you know? Well, I beg your pardon? <laughs> and you know, and has to, because we're surrounded by, we're surrounded by ho hostile population. So the question is not that the, that the kid will be divested of his, of, his, of his tools by the teacher, but that the teacher can't teach him because she doesn't respect him. If she respects him, then the kid will, res will respond to that respect, and then he can learn. But, Yeah, but it, de it, de it depends on the rapport the teacher establishes with the child, you know. Okay, I, I, t I might add something to that. If you're really interested in pursuing that particular type of thing, there's a very excellent course that's in the Department of Afro-American Studies called Afro-American Linguistics. Afro-American, it's a number 138. It's right here on this campus. I know it because I teach it, okay? <laughs> I see no need for me to, to uh, rephrase the question. I'm not entirely sure I've understood the first part of the question is about the, dominant, the dominance of the Anglo-Saxon language, right? Yeah. Afro-Saxon language. I see what you're saying. Well, I don't quite know. <laughs> I don't quite know. I, I'm not absolutely sure I've entirely understood the implications of your question, first of all, to be honest. And I don't know, you asked me to what extent, you, would, you say the Afro-Saxon language, is that your phrase? Not Anglo-Saxon, Afro-Saxon. Anglo -Saxon, Afro -Saxon. All right. To what extent does this language dominate the world, is your question, the first part of your question. And that is, um, well, I don't know quite know how to answer it because I don't quite know what, what, what the question means. Obviously, obviously, what you call the Afro-Saxon language dominates a great part of the world, you know. Um, the implications of this domination um, are what I suppose your question is addressing itself to, and that I, that I frankly cannot answer this afternoon, it's an enormous question. And the other concerns my speech, you know, you say I, I was nationalistic. Nationalistic, yeah. Well, I didn't intend to be nationalistic, you know. Um, I, can, I think I understand why you, why you, why you think that, and, and, so, and the, I suppose you're right, really. But I was addressing an American audience in, in an American context, you know. And um, concerning things which, are very, which I consider to be very urgent, happening at this moment in this country. But I was not, um, I was not um, 
or did I mean to be oblivious or to seem to be oblivious to, um, to, the world out, to the world outside this country? You understand what I'm trying to say? And um, the middle part of it about the Afro-Americans, the Africans, and the uh, ah yes, uh, the myth, the myth with respect. The, the myth you say that Af the Afro-Americans and Africans don't get together. Yeah, I don't. Well, I don't. I when I was talking to my friend over the, over yonder before about Af about the difference between going to Africa and going back to Africa, I was not implying a division. I was just in, just insisting on a kind of clarity. And I, when I myself was in Africa, I did not feel, I didn't feel at all. Um, how can I put it? I didn't feel strange at all. I, I was very happy in Africa. I learned a great deal. I want to go back. In fact, I, was a, I went to Africa prepared to be treated, as you put it, like a white man. And um, I was treated very differently. People, people told me what tribe I came from, or guessed what tribe I came from. Yeah. It, was, um, it really was as though, in contradiction to what I said before, but it really was as though for me, as though I had come home. And when I say I learned something, I, I can't put in words what it was I learned because it wasn't anything I could write down. It was something that happened inside me, out of the interaction, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think it's a very good point he's making. Even though I told you that people referred to me as white men over there, it was very, very, it was because of my speech, the way I had my clothes, etc., and the way I walked, that sort of thing. But at the same time, I have a very close affinity with many of the Africans. Once you get to understand the culture, know the people there, it was really a very big, beautiful thing. It's a perspective for any black person that goes to Africa. Somebody who had a hand way, was over here. Okay, way in the back. Okay, there's a uh, respect to rape, black-on-black uh, -black crime, and you know, uh, these, uh, with respect to Africa, are these uh, conditions or products of the society? Is that what you say? Okay. We just, we're, by the way, we're just joined by Dr. Peters, who's been very, very uh, instrumental uh, in uh, arranging the complete schedule of Mr. Baldwin while he's been here. Uh, and so I just want to welcome him to the uh, up front here. Okay, go ahead. Um, First part of your question, the black on black crimes and rape, etc. Um, I, I know how to put this. I, it seems to me very obvious that, um, first of all, I'm afraid it's going to get worse before it gets better. And um, it is obviously the, the product of this society. This society is, is not only undergoing a crisis, but is, um, is coming apart of the scenes. And when the social fabric begins to give, chaos is one of the results. And nobody in the society escapes that. It's, uh, it's tragic, but um, this society is, this is, this is, this is a very dishonest society. And it, it cannot reproduce a certain kind of monster. And it will for a while. You know, this is where you and I, all of us come in. We have to try to deal with that, but there's no point in deluding ourselves about it. As with third world countries, I, it is my impression that they have other things to do and have a, have a more coherent need for each other, you know. It is, it is our need for each other precisely because it's menaced here and makes everyone distrust everybody else here. It makes it so difficult for anything to be done or for anyone to love each other. That's why you get raped, black on black crimes and etc. all of that. No one in this country, no one in this society trusts anybody else. The world that is coming, you know, that we see beginning to come in what we call the third world countries, is, it's too soon for me to, you know, to make any guesses about it. But what I have seen of it, you know, demands of the people in it a mutual respect. And the, since they have a common, a common goal, which is something they can work toward, which is, which is their necessity, really. They have no choice but to work toward their liberation. The, the society functions on another level. And I would hazard, well, in my experience, I know that the crimes you speak of 
are more and um, are very uncommon. Okay, question over here. Okay, lady. I'm not, sure no, I'm not sure either. Would you, would you, are you saying that it, does the American Negro have a, is there a, a university or a particular place where he has a permanent place in it? I still didn't get it. Did you? I didn't get it either. It was, I, 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 I was, would you just would you just mind just just say it in two or three words? Permanent place or of achievement with respect to uh, they can. Okay, well, we'll just, uh, let's look at it in, in permanency and not in achievement. Uh, well, are you, are you referring? Yeah. Uh, okay, just uh, essentially, uh, it, it, as much as I can see from it, is there particular places or universities or is there a particular thing like as, as an American citizen you can vote or uh, how do you look at it yourself as a uh, as a as, as somebody of importance here in the United States I don't know no I'm very sorry but I didn't I didn't I didn't completely I didn't get really, it myself I didn't understand the question so the best thing, the best thing, the best thing you do is say I didn't understand the question okay we don't understand next question I'll get to you personally. Okay, uh, the question would you like to have a statement from Mr. Baldwin with respect to homosexuality that there Oh, among among blacks, homosexuality among blacks. I don't. Uh, okay, but what is what is this to do with the black scholar? What is this to do with Egypt? With Egypt? No, I'm not. I'm not trying to be funny. No. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, um, well, I got very little to say about that because um, um, homosexuality among blacks isn't different from homosexuality um, among other people. There is a kind of, um, and when I when I asked you about Egypt, this is what this is what I wanted to find out. There is a kind of, um, there is a very definite um, hostility against homosexuality among. Among some, among certain, among certain black people, uh, there's a certain image of, ma of masculinity, which the idea of homosexuality seems to attack. I think that's nonsense myself. You know, um, people are going to be, have always been, as various as people are, and uh, no one makes himself. You know, and no one can uh, foresee who he's going, who he or she is going to fall in love with, and ain't nobody's business but the person's. That's right. You know, amen. Yeah.
Amen. Lady over here. Hey, what are the important things that a black person, a black parent in particular, should have uh, in responding to their children? Okay. So well, it's a, it's save the children here. Yeah. Well, but it's um, it's, a, it's such an individual question. First of all, um, well, you're dealing with a child. You're dealing with a you're dealing with a miracle, and you're responsible for it. You know, and first of all, you have to give that child yourself. You know, and uh, and the truth. And you had to trust the child. It's, very, it's a very delicate... I never... Oh, that's not true to say I haven't raised any children. I, I've been around children all my life, you know. From the time they were... the cradle until the time they went to school. And so I know, you know, what... Um, it's the most delicate and strenuous endeavor in the world. It's much harder than writing a book. You know. But it's, it's not an endeavor where anyone can advise you, in a sense. Because every child is different, you know. And, um, and it's changing all of the time, you know, from one second, to the, one second to the next. The child is always discovering something, you know, and every discovery changes him. And some of the, and some of the discoveries are dangerous, some of the discoveries are beautiful, you know. All of the discoveries, you know, from the point of view of the parent are a little frightening. But, um, but you have to trust it. You have to trust the child. And you have to trust yourself with the child. And, and, and you cannot be too rigid about it because the, the child is going to grow up into a world which you cannot imagine. All you can do is prepare him for the world in which he will live. But you will not be able to dictate the terms of that world. Because he says at a moment in his life he's going to learn more from his peers than he can learn from you. If you see what I mean. So that everything depends on what you do with him the first seven years. If, does that make sense to you? But I can't be more specific than that. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Well, we've, we've faced this problem for generations. I would add, though, that um, unlike, unlike my, my, when I was a child, um, prepare the child for life in America was the only question, you know, because no, no, no other part of the world existed. And unlike, you know, when I was a child, there was no Africa even to be discussed. Mm. And um, when I was a child, all I knew was that I was a grandson, you know, I come from slaves, and, um, and that was it. There'd never been any clock makers or any poets or any writers or any, any, maybe a couple of boxes, but nothing else produced by black people. Now that's a terrible way to grow up. Your child, is, your, your child does not have that handicap. And it isn't only life in America you've got to prepare him for. But, but you know, when he, by the time he's 20, this century ends, and America will be much less important. It will no longer be the center of the world when this century comes to an end. You've got to prepare the child for a world that is coming much, much larger than the world in which he was born. You see what I mean? I want to know uh, uh, why did he have to leave America? And what did he discover uh, with his in France as respect to the tone of America? Uh, I left America in 1948, and it's not exactly true to say I left in order to write. I left in order to stay alive. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew that um, my life on the New York streets, in the hands of the cops and all the other hazards, um, was soon come to an end. You know, somebody would call me nigger once too often, something, you know, it was inevitable. Or I, or, or I end up in jail. So I split. And, um, and partly because, largely because, uh, I'm the oldest of nine children, and I felt responsible for them. And all I could do was write, and I could no longer do it in New York. So I went to Paris, where I did finish my first book. And in Paris I did learn, as I said before, in a kind of silence, because I didn't speak any French. Um, didn't know, I knew very few people. I lived in a kind of silence in which I was able to hear, for the first time really, um, where I really came from. And, what, and that, what, that, what 
what I really sounded like, what my father really sounded like, and, what I, and, I, got it, and I got it from the music, if you see what I mean, um, the cadence of black speech, and how, my, how I myself must have sounded when I was four or five years old. I was able to make a certain journey back into myself and into, into my past, and make a certain kind of reconciliation with myself and my past. And then I was able to, then I was able to grow up. If that answers you. Mm -hmm. I would have been killed. Yeah. The, the question I, I, was, no. what, what, what do you think would have happened if he had, had you not left? Well, I once asked my brother that, and he answered me very, very succinctly. He said, you'd be dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's true. If I had not left, I would be dead. I'm not being romantic about that. You'd recall some of the quotes that I read earlier when he won his age and told him to burn the book. Yes, yeah, that's right. You know, so this is uh, some idea. Okay, we're over here, fans. I mean that, though. Okay. Well, just please try to confine as much as possible. Go ahead. Last one, please. Okay. Okay. Essentially, what you're looking at is literature. How do people look at literature? Black literature in Africa. Then it has to do with uh, black labels, such as Afro-American, black Afro-Am, that sort of stuff. Thirdly, has to do with uh, um, what with the voice? Yeah, with the, the voice. And lastly, what was the last one? Um, Why someone becoming black? Now you have the choice of four of the four there so to to respond to. Which one would you like to do? It's okay, choice to die in Ghana. So you want to let him respond to one of those? Which one would you like to? Well, it's a package, isn't it? Um, a package is a package. Um, it's a nice, nice package. It's a nice though. package, though. But um, I don't know where I don't know how to begin it. Let me get into the end. Um, the end, okay. Yeah, I, yes, I, you know, I, I, um, I agree. I agree. I agree with Dubois. You no, know, um, almost entirely. He was a very great, you no, know, very great scholar, a very great man. It depend, I must add to that that um, in the time in which we live, everything depends on how you how you interpret what you mean by the word revolution. Because this, this will have, this, we cannot have a, um, an armed insurrection in this country at this moment. You know, I'm just trying to be realistic. They got the guns. So we had to, so we had to do it another way. Yeah. No, that's a, but that's all right, because it will be done. As for um, the, um, I think you asked me about the, the reception of black American writers abroad, right? Or, or, or specifically in Africa. Europe, Europe wasn't it? You said black literature in Europe, is that what you were? Abroad, abroad, abroad in general, okay. Well, black literature uh, abroad, black, is, um, is not very well known, you know, well, not very well known. It's beginning, beginning to be better known, I'm thinking now of, uh, of English African writers and French African writers and some from the Caribbean and some, and some Americans, of course. But it's only beginning to be known because um, it's just as Africa is only beginning to be known. This is a black experience. It's only beginning now to be known. If you see what I mean. And you had one other question about what advice? Oh, what yes, labels. Uh, about yeah. labels. Well, I must admit that the question of what um, black people in America should be called 
is not, you know, is not very urgent in my mind. At the moment, we seem to be more or less re reconciled to being Afro-Americans, which is perfectly all right with me, you know. Uh, it seems to more or less suggest the truth about, our, you know, our situation and our identity, and even um, something about our potential. And as for the advice I might be able to give to a young literary um, uh, genius, <laughs> genius. <laughs> to a young literary genius, um, let, me, let me tell you one thing. Young literary geniuses don't take anybody's advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go way over here. Question. You. Yeah. You. Yeah. A black what? A black what? Like she like to, Mr. Baldwin, to comment on public uh, education in in America, especially with respect to blacks, yeah. especially with respect to blacks, and, uh, and especially why on this university the, the black enrollment very low. I, I I don't know if he can really respond to that or not, but just go ahead. I don't. I'll do my best. I I, I I'll begin with the public school situation, which I know more about. And that's a very, it's a very difficult question to answer, too. It's a difficult answer because, first of all, it's, um, it's, um, you can't begin to answer without feeling terribly futile. And um, look, the truth is it's very hard to talk about education in this country without talking about the whole society in which it, in which it mainly fails to occur. Um, you can't, um, you can hardly talk about schools, you know, without talking about cities. And the cities are in the hands of financiers. The cities in the hands of pirates, thugs. And our children, therefore, are therefore um, are victims of, of this, are, vi are victims of um, the, the principles according to which the country is run. The country is not run according to the, you know, either the will of its citizens, I hope, or the good of its citizens, I know that, but for profit, for money, to make money. And education is a billion dollar industry. And the least important part of that industry is the child. I think this is a criminal, but this is the way it works. Now, the public education uh, in the city in which I grew up, you know, is, um, is enough to break the heart, you know, enough, to, enough to make you want to kill. But, and when we have tried, and we're trying again, and we've tried over and over and over again, to educate our children ourselves, to, um, to be responsible for the teaching, the, the curriculum, for the books, uh, we did that for three years in New York some years ago, and the experiment succeeded for three years. And because it succeeded, it was crashed, it was smashed by the Board of Education, the Teachers Union, and Albany. You know, so that is what you're up against. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. That's what, that's what one's, one's up against. As for the enrollment at this college, um, let's face it. Um, Black people in this country have a terrible time just getting through 24 hours a day. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely true, you know. And education, in a, it's hard to talk about education in a country in which illiteracy is, 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 um, illiteracy is adored. It's hard, to talk, it's hard to talk about education in a country where people take seriously some, such a creature as John, as John Wayne and Ronald Reagan. You know, <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, I'm not, I, I really am not trying to be funny, it's true, you know. And for a black person to get an education in this country, he has, he's got to have a lot of guts, first of all. And to endure, I'm sorry, you know, to be, I don't mean to be rude, but this institution is like many other institutions, and which, which means it's a racist institution. You know, Amen. That there's no way around that. All the American institutions are racist. 
And to get an education under those circumstances is a tremendous act of the will. And also you risk schizophrenia. But <laughs> I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this because I think black people should not be educated, but I am saying that black people very largely educate themselves. What, one do, what, what you have to do is pick up the tools and with your own intention. You know, that's the trick. Okay, I'll take a question. Before that, uh, I'd like to mention one thing is, is that uh, it's a very good thing that you're bringing up this question about low enrollment of black students. In fact, I think uh, the fact that Mr. Baldwin's been here for a long time here at the university, roughly the past four or five years, we've been trying to get together a black scholars conference. And I think that James Baldwin's appearance here is a, as a region's lectureship that is going to help to be more or less the catalyst for bringing that sort of thing about. And many of us can get together and think, and look, it's not just for the University of California, it's for many of the other institutions around here, but of course the University of California is the biggie, and uh, we should set the pace on a lot of things. And so I hope that something like this will be forthcoming if we, if we do get some sort of a conference that will be materialized. Okay, a question right over here. Gentlemen, it's been antsy for a while. No, I don't. No, I'm not. I'm not. I've not read it. I've not seen it. Is that your question? No, I'm not. You want to know if he was familiar with the play for Colored Girls Only by Mr. Saki? He said he was not. Okay. Okay. Question. Thank you. Come on. Bring it on. Two questions. Okay. The what factor? The what and why? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, no need to repeat the question. The what and why factors. Well, it, it, it's um, the what and why factors is always a little difficult to, um, you know, to isolate. And well, I, how can I put it? I began to write around the time I started to read, and I was, you know, I was fascinated by, I was fascinated by people and all that. I used to do, you know, Christmas pageants for the church, and and I wrote school song, you know, which my my poor brothers had to sing for years. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you know, that I never, I never thought of that as. Um, it didn't occur to me I was going to be a writer. I've been, I began to be a writer in my own mind, really. And this has a lot to do with my father. Largely because of my father, I entered, I entered the pulpit when I was 14. Largely because of my father, but not only because of my father. And I was in the pulpit for three years. Now. A great many things happened to me in that three years in the pulpit. And one of them was being exposed in a way I never had been before. And of course, you know, I was, you know, I was an adolescent. You know, it's also involved with puberty. Um, seeing for the first time, you know, the brothers and the sisters of the church, and really seeing the lives they led, and the role, you know, the church played in their lives, and the role that I, as a young minister, played in their lives, too. And it was kind of overwhelming, you know, um, to be exposed to so much misery, so much love, so much faith, so much terror, so much pain, you know, day in and day out, week in and week out, for three and a half, you know, for those three years. And I eventually came, I eventually, my father and I thought about it, but I eventually felt that I had no right to stay in the pulpit, but I, you know, it was um, I was doing something wrong. That I it was um, I couldn't bring them what they needed, and I no longer believed as I had believed when I was 14. And so I left. But I know that if it had not been for that, you know, I would I might not have become a writer. And the maturation process you talk about is concerns my father. My father died when I was 19, and he died, that is, before we could become reconciled. And that, um, that, that pain um, is, is the, um, the root of Go Tell It on the Mountain, you know, which it took me 10 years to write. 
But in that 10 years, as far as anyone ever grows up, you know, in that 10 years, I, from 17 to 27, by the time I, I finished novel when I was 27, and then I began to grow up. Because I knew who my father was, and, you know. Very nice. Right, right here. Great. Yes, you. Yes, uh, yes, stand up. Okay, uh, question was the term nigger, uh, why does he use, uh, his definition of the term and why does he use it so often? Well, it's a term, um, I know that it's a very controversial term in fact, but um, I use it in many ways, you know. Um, it's a word, it's, it's uh, if you excuse, excuse the expression, the word is a, is a little like motherfucker, you know. You know. <laughs> Which did you say, motherfucker or motherfucker? <laughs> anyway, go ahead. It, it's a word which which can, depending on who is saying it and to whom, you know, can can mean almost anything. Yeah, it, can call, it can cause a fight. It can lead to a wedding. You know. <laughs> <laughs> It's especially if she says, you're my nigga. <laughs> does, does that answer your question? <laughs> my definition? Well, obviously the word, you know, comes, it's, um, what, is, what does the word come from? The root is a Spanish word for black, you know. Um, but the way, what, what niggas have done with the word, or what we have done with the word, has, not, has very little to do with that. If you see what I mean. The gut feeling? Well, look, so obviously, obviously the world is full of people who better not call me nigger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from, from my baby brother, you know. Um, well, my baby brother's the only man in the world I'm scared of because he's bigger than I am now. And he remembers when he was smaller. You know? <laughs> and David's mad at me, he called me nigger one way. And he's not mad at me, it's something else, you know. And um, it's one of, um, it's, I don't, I'm not sure I can define it, but it's one of the, um, it's uh, part of um, a system of, of um, telegraph sig signals, you know. It's, hmm? Big pardon? What I always thought was, you know, cr you know it comes from the word Negro, which is Spanish word for black, and then we, you know. Okay. Which you might be right. It's, it's anyway, that, that doesn't answer you at all. I think it's a good point. One thing, that especially he mentioned about it being a filler, uh, this is a lot, you'll find a lot of it in, in the black culture, especially with the, this whole thing of black English, black speech, where people will use the word nigger, in other words, as fillers, not necessarily directed at a particular individual thing, no. but as, as a kind of a filler, I think it's very good. And the young lady down here said it came from Africa. It's a very good possibility. Yeah, it's a good possibility, too. There's yeah. a word yeah. in some African languages, because it ninga, mm -hmm which whenever it came over here and converged with English, the good possibility of it being nigger. Okay, right here.
Okay, can you hear some more of the political view? I think it's very good. I'll just let Mr. Baldwin go ahead as to whatever he wants to do on that. Well, you know, I, first, first of all, let me say, you know, that I don't consider myself um, a, a leader. I don't, don't consider myself to be a spokesman. I don't consider, you know, that, um, I don't consider that, well, how can I put this? My political views, yes, I have very strong political views. I don't know that, um, since I, I'm trying, let, me, let me try to be clear about this. I don't, I don't, what I'm trying to say is I don't have a social or a political blueprint. I'm not equipped to lead a revolution. I'm equipped perhaps to make you think, or to, you know, you know. But the reason, but the reason that, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, let's try to, let's try to, okay, we'll take you, I beg your pardon? Well, I see, so we have a big hodgepodge of a lot of things. Okay. Yeah, so, well, you asked, you asked me an enormous question, but uh, let's, um, well, first I'll be general and we'll try to be precise. Um, for example, um, I, I concluded a long time ago, as I said before, we can't really talk about anything until we talk, talk about the economic system. And I concluded a long time ago that this economic system, for many, 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 many reasons, you know, is, um, is doomed. And frankly, you know, it could not, can't end a moment too soon. It is, you know, it's caused fantastic grief and waste and, um, and, and does until today. And all of the things that the lady over there was talking about, like affirmative action or equal opportunity and all of those things, um, are menaced and, uh, by, the, by the stranglehold of this system. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is whatever, whatever we are talking about, we have, we have to bear in mind that well, that is what we are up against, that, that is what has to be in one way or another defeated, uh, outwitted, um, overthrown finally, or it will, you know, it will fall of its own weight. But they, we are always in that shadow, you know. And our intentions, which are really essentially, after all, to save our children, uh, is not the intention of this republic. It was never intended, after all, let us tell the truth about it, it was never intended that we should be free here, and it was never intended that we should be able to talk to each other as we are doing now. It was not a part of the will of the American Republic. Yeah. Now, once politics has to be based, has, has to come from that, and the reason it's difficult for me sometimes to discuss my political views is because it demands a vast amount of improvisation from day to day. For example, how in the world, you know, our president is against political prisoners, and he said that to the whole, whole world, right? And he's for human rights. But we have thousands of political prisoners sitting in, you know, in, sitting in jail in this country right now. For example, Ben Chavitz in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And all of our effort until this hour has failed to get him released. You know what I mean? The question is then, how do we do that? And furthermore, behind Ben Chavitz, there are, lot, there are thousands of boys sitting in the tombs right now who have, who have absolutely no right to be there, no reason to be there. How do we get them out? And we, and we know very well that you, you know, we can march and petition the mayor, the president, and we have done it for years and years and years. And it's not until there is something, some advantage they can gain from responding. It's only then that they respond. Now I will add this. 
I will add this, there's a responsibility, since we have so, so we can expect such little help from our, most of our co-citizens, and none at all from the, from, the, from the power structure, then we have to be, you know, we're in an unprecedented situation which demands unprecedented means. So there, are, there, there being no historical precedent for our situation, Marx nor Lenin can help us here. You know, European history does not help us here. History doesn't help, history doesn't give us any example of the people, the black people of this country and the situation that we are in and where we came from and how we have endured. So we had to forge a new politics with a, great, with a vast amount of cunning and I might add a vast amount of silence. Amen. Okay, the question is, how, do, how would Mr. Baldwin, would he respond to, I think it's uh, Cheryl Wallace? Michelle Wallace. Michelle Wallace, with the, she, the work that she has done at the Super Ego or something like that. It's the Black Macho and the Mrs. Black, Black Macho Woman. Sort of thing. Well, um, I've not read the book.